I think we've lumped a bunch of these illegal drugs or substances together. Some of them have been shown for a long time to have stunning and profound therapeutic benefits. Seemingly overnight, people have been starting to prescribe or use psychedelic therapies like ketamine therapy, or there's that quote, like an overnight success is 10 years in the making. <laughs> in this case, ketamine would be 20 years in the making. Uh, the first study on ketamine for depression was published in 2000. Uh, and since then, over 100 clinical studies have been published showing consistently the safety and efficacy of ketamine therapy for a range of mental health care issues. You're listening to Inside Mental Health, a Psych Central podcast where experts share experiences and the latest thinking on mental health and psychology. Here's your host, Gabe Howard. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. I'm your host, Gabe Howard, and calling in today, we have Dylan Bynan. Dylan is the founder and CEO of Mind Bloom, a mental health company that is transforming lives through the use of psychedelic medicine, starting with ketamine therapy. Mind Bloom has been featured by the likes of the New York Times, Vogue, and Women's Health, and its clinicians facilitate over 100,000 ketamine therapy sessions annually. Dylan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Gabe. I'm really excited to chat with you today. This is a really important topic, not just for patients and the behavioral healthcare system, uh, but for me personally, as somebody who grew up in a family that was obliterated by the mental health crisis. Uh, so I'm really excited to share the you know what I know. Oh, I appreciate that so much, Dylan. Let's go ahead and rip the Band-Aid off and address the elephant in the room. People for years have said that they use illicit drugs, street drugs, to treat their mental health issues. And historically, we have referred to that behavior as self-medicating. And we really looked down on people for that. We really look at it very negatively. But now, seemingly overnight, companies like yours legitimize the use of previously illegal substances. And now, of course, they're called treatments. Now, it begs the question, does this mean that the people using formerly illegal drugs to treat their mental health conditions were, in fact, right all along? I mean, I think we should be talking about the fact that the mental health crisis is so bad with so many people suffering despite trying so many different treatments for so long that people have needed to go underground to get the help that they need. Like People are sick and the system has not been able to help them, uh, which is why the curve on the mental health crisis just keeps getting steeper and steeper. Uh, Suicide and overdose deaths have become the top two leading causes of death for Americans under the age of 45. About a quarter of Americans have a diagnosable mental illness. Uh, depression is the number one cause of disability worldwide. And so it's no wonder that people are seeking treatments uh, that potentially aren't being provided directly by their healthcare providers. I wanted to ask you about the study that your company, Mind Bloom, did with researchers from UCSF, NYU, the Cleveland Clinic, Houston Methodist, and MAPS. You, you all got together and you've published the largest ever peer-reviewed clinical study of ketamine therapy. And the study's conclusion was, quote, at-home ketamine therapy is the most effective treatment for depression and anxiety currently available, unquote. Can you give us some more details and how did that study come together? And one of my big goals at MindBloom uh, was to play some small part and apply my um, you know, talents to uh, progressing the psychedelic therapy and behavioral healthcare space. Uh, so we thought that there was an opportunity uh, to not just give people an injection of ketamine, which is what we saw other providers mostly doing, largely ER doctors and anesthesiologists, uh, but do what we saw a smaller number of providers doing, which is providing a more uh, holistic, comprehensive, hands-on a system of psychosocial support for patients going through ketamine therapy. Uh, it's something that looks more like a psychedelic therapy modality. Uh, we're helping people prepare for each session, get the most out of each session, and then you know, integrate each session. Uh, so from day one, we were collecting clinical outcomes uh, when we started treating our first patients in March of 2019 uh, with gold standard depression anxiety scales that are used by every pharmaceutical company and researcher for anxiety and depression. Uh, We recruited a board of nationally renowned medical advisors in uh, psychiatry, brain imaging, and psychedelic therapy to build those protocols and collect that data and evaluate that data. Uh, And after we had treated several thousand patients, uh, began running those clinical studies on the patient populations to evaluate the outcomes. We published 
uh, what, as you mentioned, is the largest ever peer reviewed clinical study in ketamine therapy history, uh, demonstrating that the at home ketamine therapy uh, treatment program that my bones providers are providing are like literally the most effective treatments for anxiety and depression that are currently available. Uh, so, uh, whereas say 40 to 47% of patients have a clinically significant response of like a 50% improvement in symptoms from SSRIs uh, with about 30 to 50% having side effects, many of which are really severe, like weight gain, sexual dysfunction, insomnia. Uh, At-home ketamine therapy was working for 40% more people, 63% of patients, uh, and one-tenth as many were having side effects at less than 5%. And those side effects are also a lot lighter. Uh, not to mention ketamine therapy works a lot more quickly because SSRIs take six to eight weeks to work. And those results for ketamine show up in uh, one to two sessions. Now, if I understand the study correctly, at the end of four weeks, 62.8% of the participants reported a 50% improvement or more in their depression and anxiety symptoms. But I'm curious because if I understand correctly, that study did not have a placebo component. So are, are we... You know, four weeks isn't isn't a lot of time. I, I mean, is that enough time to really determine that it was the ketamine and not just a change in routine or being fussed over or having something new to do or a desire to please the interviewer or the doctor? Could any of those things contributed to the results that you're seeing? Do you think you would get the same results if you did the study over six months, for example? We get asked a lot about uh, whether or not you know this should be run as a randomized controlled, you know, clinical or randomized clinical trial or a placebo controlled trial. Uh, so there's sort of two types of uh, data that can come out of a lot of these studies. Uh, there's lab data, and then there's real world evidence. Uh, so lab data is the data that's collected uh, usually by pharmaceutical companies when they're running clinical trials uh, to see if a drug is safe and effective. And then real world evidence is the data that's actually used in clinical practice day to day by real providers treating real patients um, versus study participants who are you know hand selected and really handheld through the process. Uh, so as you can imagine, usually lab data is superior to real world evidence data. Uh, it looks a little bit better because it's hyper controlled. You know who's going through and how they're getting the treatment. Uh, so when you look at a really large study, uh, so this study we, we ran um, with researchers and physicians from uh, MAPS, Cleveland Clinic, UCSF, NYU, Houston Methodist, uh, the largest academic uh, research health system in, the, in Texas. Um, when we ran that, the N was 1,250, <laughs> which is extremely large for a behavioral healthcare study, much less a ketamine therapy study. Uh, usually when we look at different ketamine therapy studies, uh, and a lot of behavioral health studies, we're seeing that the ends are in like the 30, 40, 50 range. And we're actually currently running a study that's going to be six or seven times larger uh, with nearly uh, 10,000 patients uh, that's going to be published uh, later this year. Um, and it's also going to look at a little bit more at the durability of effects to your question earlier. Uh, another thing I think is, is interesting when you look at ketamine therapy studies is that in science right now, we know that we have a replication crisis, uh, especially in social studies and social sciences and, potentially, and oftentimes even like neuroscience. Uh, so one study that comes out and has great effects when people try to run the same study, uh, we don't have consistent outcomes. Uh, but when you look at ketamine therapy, as I mentioned, there have been over the last 20 years, over 100 published clinical studies, uh, which is more than every other psychedelic medicine combined. Uh, and they nearly across the board all demonstrate these exceptional outcomes. Um, so I think when you look at that, you see like a very clear line of regression and consistency, uh, you know, anecdotal evidence of thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients' lives being transformed to side um, that this is really, you know, effective and really safe for people. These are, of course, incredible results, but frankly, it does seem too good to be true. Oh, take this and it's magical and you're going to be healed and it's quick and easy and it doesn't even hurt. I, I, I did actually find an ad online. It was not an ad for your company, but another provider. And it said, quote, this treatment is like a year of therapy in two weeks, unquote. Everything is saying that this is the ultimate solution. It is a silver bullet. You've been struggling for a long time, but you take this and you will be all better. So when you say that a lot of providers aren't willing to consider ketamine therapy for their patients, maybe this is why. It literally just sounds like snake oil. It all sounds too good to be true. 
haven't we lowered the bar way too much if we think that there can't be something that actually works for mental health? <laughs> like, very, like, like very good when, point. <laughs> uh, when I have a headache and I take ibuprofen or Tylenol, my headache goes away. Like, is that too good to be true? Like, no, like there are many areas of healthcare where treatments largely work. Uh, we've solved them, right? Like we built a, we created a polio vaccine so that we don't get polio anymore. Uh, we have specific antibiotics that obliterate bacterial infections. So we just don't get those infections anymore or overcome those infections very quickly. Uh, mental health is one where we are approaching it, I I believe, I think it's very clear as a society, like it's this intractable problem that is nearly unsolvable. Like we've accepted that mental health care treatments don't work and there can't be something that, you know, bends or inverts this curve where the mental health crisis is getting worse and worse and worse. And so one of the things that I believe looking at the clinical research on ketamine therapy, on MDMA therapy, which looks like it's going to be available next year, psilocybin-assisted therapy, uh, is that these treatments have the opportunity and the promise to invert that curve for the first time in a long time uh, and actually start uh, making it so that you know the, the sh mental health crisis ship <laughs> isn't just continuing to fill with water and sink, uh, but that the buckets are actually big enough and have few enough holes that we can actually start, uh, you know, pouring the water out of the ship and, and getting the ship to rise again. So why does it have such a bad reputation? Is it just that it began its life as an illegal street drug? What are the biggest misconceptions that the general public has about ketamine therapy? Hey, listeners, your host, Gabe Howard here, and I want to help you save money on your prescription medications. I just learned about a prescription discount program called Optum Perks that is completely free to use. There aren't any restrictions or requirements. It's super easy. Just bring the free coupon to over 64,000 pharmacies nationwide and save. Optum Perks beats the competition in price 70% of the time. And because it is not insurance, everyone qualifies. To learn more, visit OptumPerks.com podcast or download the app at the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's OptumPerks.com podcast. Gabe Howard here to tell you about the Inside Bipolar podcast from Healthline Media. He does the show with me, Dr. Nicole Washington, a board-certified psychiatrist. That's right. A guy living with bipolar and a psychiatrist team up to discuss living well with bipolar disorder. Listen now on your favorite podcast player or visit psychcentral.com slash IBP to learn more. Subscribe now so you don't miss out. And we're back discussing ketamine therapy with the founder and CEO of Mindbloom, Dylan Bynon. First, the fact that there are myths and stigmas around ketamine is actually extremely important uh, because right now, uh, fear for patients is one of the biggest blockers for them trying a safe and efficacious treatment that could completely change their entire mental health care journey. Uh, and a lot of these stigmas or lack of education are also slowing providers down from adopting them. Uh, so I'm glad you asked this question. Uh, to me, it's that ketamine is new and it's experimental. Uh, in fact, uh, ketamine has been safely used for over 50 years as an anesthetic and analgesic. Uh, it's used every single day in every single ER, emergency room, and hospital in the United States of America uh, on adults and especially on children. Uh, it's on the World Health Organization's list of the top 100 most essential medicines in the world uh, because it's arguably the safest anesthetic. Um, uh, 20 years ago, where researchers began discovering that it had these really profound and impressive uh, antidepressive effects, researchers started noticing that people who came into the ER and received ketamine uh, for different traumas, like physical traumas, uh, when they left, started reporting less depression. Uh, and that was one of the things that inspired them to start looking into could ketamine on its own at even at uh, sub anesthetic doses. So say at mind bloom patients are getting like one fifth to one twentieth of what a child receives in the ER. Uh, it's much, a much lower dose and ketamine therapy for anxiety and depression, uh, not as an anesthetic and analgesic, uh, has actually been used by thousands of providers 
over the last 20 years uh, with over 100 published clinical studies on its safety and efficacy uh, in that time period. Uh, however, a lot of people don't know this, and a lot of patients and providers still think of this as a treatment of last resort. After I've tried everything else, I will go to ketamine therapy. Uh, but when you look at the clinical outcomes, both from a lot of published studies uh, and from real-world evidence in practices like uh, what's going on in MindBloom, uh, where over 300,000 treatment sessions uh, have been facilitated since 2019 by hundreds of providers, uh, what you see is that uh, this is actually more efficacious than traditional treatments, much lower side effect profile, works way faster. And from a patient's experience, it can sometimes be challenging, but it's usually quite pleasant. Um, sometimes extremely pleasant. Uh, and for those reasons, we should be thinking about ketamine therapy as a treatment of first resort, not a treatment of last resort, uh, but we're still pretty far because of these stigmas. I think there's also the element uh, where uh, it has a bad brand <laughs> uh, and it needs to undergo a rebranding. Uh, one of the most common questions I hear about ketamine is, isn't that a horse tranquilizer? That's like asking, isn't Valium just a horse tranquilizer? <laughs> I did not know that about ketamine. And I, 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 I want to admit, I also thought of it as just special K or, or simply as a horse tranquilizer. And it is interesting that that is the backstory because I don't think that people realize that compared to other areas of medicine, mental health just does not get a lot of love in frontline research. A lot of our progress and available treatments have been repurposed from other research areas pharmaceutical companies, researchers, doctors, they're investigating a solution, a cure, a treatment for something else. And then during that process, they discover it helps something on the mental health side. So of course they, they do more research, they isolate how it's helping, and then they, they figure that out. But make no mistake, they weren't setting out in the beginning to research a mental health condition. They were researching something else and we just got lucky. There is very little front end mental health research being funded. And some of our best treatments have come from researching something else. Now, I want to move this away from mental health for a moment and move it into the physical health realm because I want to point out that erectile dysfunction, that breakthrough did not come because they were researching erectile dysfunction. They were not looking for ED meds. They were trying to find a drug for hypertension. And then, you know, during the studies, they noticed that male participants all got erections and they're like, hey, wait a minute, that's unusual. So they started investigating and isolating and they found the ED treatment. And of course, it's been super successful. It's everywhere. It's on every television. We've got people sitting in bathtubs over cliffs holding their spouse's hand. But do you think that some of the apprehension surrounding ketamine therapy is because most people with mental illness and their loved ones just don't understand that ketamine is not that special? Almost all of our treatments were, for lack of a better word, borrowed from somewhere else. You, you just inspired me, Gabe, to look up uh, some of the biggest inventions that were accidental in human history. <laughs> I, I think a stunning number of inventions are actually discovered accidentally. Uh, penicillin, as I think most people, a lot of people know, is discovered accidentally. Uh, you know, that's sort of the, one of the one of the first, if not the first, uh, it was the first antibiotic. Uh, the microwave was discovered accidentally. Uh, smoke detectors, dynamite, uh, the blood thinner warfarin, uh, which is um, a, a massive medication. Uh, Coca-Cola was discovered accidentally. <laughs> um, so it's not completely surprising to me that uh, when mental health has not been at the forefront of policymakers, uh, of the national conversation, uh, of the healthcare system, and that a lot of the discoveries in it have been accidental. Uh, and ketamine, I think, is one of those, or ketamine for uh, depression and anxiety and other mood disorders is one of those. Dylan, let's pivot. We, we've, we've talked about the, the internet's opinion. We've talked about society's opinion. We've talked about the media's opinion, but we haven't talked about the patient opinion. What are your patients seeing? How do they feel about this treatment? One of the things, Gabe, that surprises people most when I talk to them about mind bloom is who our patients are. I think a lot of people see a consumer health platform that advertises on you know, Instagram and gets a lot of press and you know things like you pointed out, like you know New York Times, Wall Street Journal, podcasts, uh, as they assume that our patient population is very young. Uh, in reality, our median patient is 41 years old. Uh, we have more patients over the age of 57 than in their 20s. Uh, it's about 55, 45 female male, which is actually a very male 
patient population and behavioral health. Um, and our patients are people who have suffered from mental health care issues for a long time, usually. Uh, they've suffered for 5, 10, 20, 30 years, and they've tried so many other treatment options like my mother and my sister did, uh, and ultimately have not been able to find relief. Uh, for instance, uh, my father, uh, who is my hero, uh, after my sister died last year uh, from her fentanyl overdose, right after getting out of a 90-day inpatient rehab facility, uh, he was in a deep uh, suicidal depression. Uh, he'd already been depressed for years, and I tried to get him to try ketamine therapy, um, but ultimately, I think sort of the fear and the stigma uh, was too much for him to overcome to build up that activation energy. Um, but after my sister died, he he was you know on, on the verge of suicide. Uh, I had meditated on it and uh, essentially assigned him like a 50-50 chance of surviving the next 30 to 60 days. You're getting messages from him uh, with things like, here are all my passwords just in case. Uh, here's where I have silver hidden around the uh, you know, our, our small home that we grew up in, in Anaheim, California, uh, in, in case anything happens. Um, we finally were able to get him uh, to try ketamine therapy. Uh, and he did it through MindBloom, working directly with our medical director, Dr. Leonardo Vondo. Uh, and after even just a few sessions, achieved complete remission from uh, suicidal ideation. Uh, he sounds 30 years younger. Uh, he's done a few different programs now, and he's exercising, he's eating healthier. He has goals, which he hasn't had for a long time. It's like cleaning up and renovating and you know, sort of organizing his home and making it his Um and uh, it's been absolutely incredible to see and you know to have the opportunity to have helped one person you know in my family uh, with their mental health care issue because people are truly dying from the mental health crisis. Uh, and that's a story that is so it's a story that we see literally every single day at Mindbloom. Uh, every single day we're seeing people who haven't just had profound and impressive results. Uh, when it comes to getting through anxiety and depression, but are literally saying that their lives have been saved from this medication. And one of the things that makes me really proud about that is that I know from my experience growing up in a family with mental health issues, that mental illness doesn't just affect and is tragic for that individual who's suffering, but it has this massive ripple effect on their friends, family, uh, the work that they can or can't do in the world. You know, hurt people hurt people, uh, whether or not you know the person's hurt. Is, is in control of that or not. Uh, and so I know every one of these transformational client stories is creating a positive ripple effect out to the people around them. Um, and I think that's how we can bend the curve on this mental health care crisis. Dylan, this has been great, but we are almost out of time. Where can folks find MindBloom on the web? Uh, mindbloom.com. Perfect. Dylan, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Gabe. This was a blast. I love your questions. This is a, a really unique conversation uh, that I'm excited to uh, share with the world. I'm excited too. Thank you once again for being here, Dylan. And of course, a big thank you to all of our listeners. My name is Gabe Howard, and I'm an award-winning public speaker, and I could be available for your next event. I also wrote the book, Mental Illness is an Asshole and Other Observations, which you can get on Amazon. However, you can grab a signed copy with free show swag or learn more about me by heading over to GabeHoward.com. Wherever you downloaded this episode, please follow or subscribe to the show. It is absolutely free and you don't want to miss a thing. And hey, can you do me a favor? Recommend the show to everyone you know, because sharing the show is how we're going to grow. I will see everybody next Thursday on Inside Mental Health. You've been listening to Inside Mental Health, a Psych Central podcast from Healthline Media. Have a topic or guest suggestion? Email us at show at psychcentral.com. Previous episodes can be found at psychcentral.com slash show or on your favorite podcast player. Thank you for listening. Hey, listeners, your host, Gabe Howard here, and I want to help you save money on your prescription medications. I just learned about a prescription discount program called Optum Perks that is completely free to use. There aren't any restrictions or requirements. It's super easy. Just bring the free coupon to over 64,000 pharmacies nationwide and save. Optum Perks beats the competition in price 70% of the time. And because it is not insurance, everyone qualifies. To learn more, visit optumperks.com podcast 
or download the app at the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's optimperks.com slash podcast.